for the mothers and sisters of the House of Valladolid. Rome, September 8, 1950. On September 8, 1950, the Junerate of Valladolid was inaugurated. On this occasion, Mother Christina writes this letter, in which she highlights the importance of a good formation oriented to the fulfillment of the mission which God has entrusted to the Institute. Since I will not be able to join you personally for the inauguration of that junery, I want to make myself present at this event, which we can describe as great, with a few words and of course, I will be present spiritually. A great event, because it will be one means, a useful means which promises good results, that will allow the Institute to fulfill, with ever greater efficacy, its double objective of reparation and apostolate. Great as well, because it represents the growth and full flowering of a work which our mother foundresses sowed and cultivated with great care. Keep in mind what our venerable mother wrote in 1881, speaking about education. Education does not hold a secondary place with us, far from it. This is seen by the fact that we have among our religious qualified and experienced teachers. These teach other religious who seem to have sufficient ability. Doesn't this center of teacher training, which is being inaugurated, a center in which ours will be both professors and students, correspond exactly to this sentiment? Indeed, this work has come into being as part of the growing organization of Junerates in fulfillment of the legislation of the most recent general congregation, which focused on adapting our works of zeal to the needs of the modern day, without losing in the smallest degree air fidelity to the genuine spirit of our congregation. This is something I want to point out to you in a special way. The way in which the studies to which you will dedicate yourselves have to be impregnated with the spirit of reparation and directed to carrying out more fully the mission which God has confided to our institute. Today, when culture is no longer the privilege of a few, but is extended to ever greater numbers, it is impossible to maintain the prestige required to do good to souls, even in the case of simple peoples, without uniting, to solid virtue and a delicate way of dealing with people, a wealth of knowledge beyond what is common, something which may enhance our reputation. For this reason, it is not just those who will be dedicated to teaching it goes without saying that no one knows her own future mission, but rather everyone, who must give themselves to study with determination and with the noble aim that the Institute may be qualified to serve God and His Holy Church in everything with which He and she deign to entrust her. It is not without the special providence of God, who directs all things, that this Junery has its home in the city historically dedicated to the Sacred Heart, the official center of this devotion in Spain, as if to make visible for us his desire that this work be not only an academic center, but also a house of ardent love for his divine heart, so that the apostles that come out of the Junery may be willing to spread it in any place and to do and suffer anything necessary to accomplish it. Cristina Estrada Aside, to the superiors of the houses of Spain with primary schools. Rome, October 2, 1951. In this letter, Mother Christina asks that an effort be made to improve teaching in schools. She gives, to this end, very valid orientations, such as a good preparation for teachers and getting the girls to attend school regularly. Finally, she exhorts the sisters to deeply love this apostolic work so characteristic of the Institute. Since I wrote to the mother provincials at the beginning of summer, encouraging them to make an effort to improve our primary schools and giving them some instructions on how to do so, I have wanted to write to you as well, to encourage you to cooperate with them with the greatest possible effort toward this work of renewal which we have begun. I am going to address in the paragraphs that follow a few aspects of the schools in which you can and should contribute very important and useful assistance. This makes us realize that, following the norm given us in our constitutions, the instruction we must give in our schools has to be better than what we have provided up to this point. However, not only for this reason, there are two additional factors that should motivate us to strive to provide to our students a relatively high level of cultural formation. It is an incontrovertible fact that the young woman of today lives in a situation of greater freedom where greater inducements to evil can be found, much more so now than 50 years ago. In order to remain on the right path, our current students need to have very firm principles and well-defined personalities.
The other reason to promote culture among our students is the following. We do not educate these girls for today's world. We educate them so that they may act freely in 10, 20, 50 years. Modern day society is changing in the sense of giving equal rights to women and men, to children of humble families, and to those of the wealthy. Because of this, many leaders, such as those from Catholic Action, Marian Congregations, and economic and political organizations already come from the working class. The influence of these leaders with their peers is greater when their natural qualities are united to better education and an improved ability to study and deepen their intellectual understanding of the problems of life and of the organization, and to resolve them in a practical way. Our concern, then, is that if the working classes will produce many leaders, that they be those who, because of being educated by religious, have a deeper and more educated faith. These, among others, are the reasons that have made it necessary for us to draw up in our schools a plan of relatively rigorous studies, as you will have seen in the norms. I hope that by reflecting on these reasons I have indicated and becoming aware of their significance and the importance of education, you will begin the work of removing from our schools anything that could place an obstacle in the way of these changes. Second, so that the formation we offer be more complete, we have managed to put in place, as a means to keep our students with us for a greater length of time, the certification for professional initiation with its two sections of home and business. Third, an element that is very important in order for schools to obtain the fruit which the Lord desires is qualified personnel. As it is impossible to completely reorganize all of the schools of Spain this year, I wrote to the provincials asking them to update at least two schools in each province. Fourth, in order to regulate the entire life of the schools it is very necessary that they have well-defined rules and regulations. Fifth, Everyone has manifested their feelings about their fear of having to dismiss girls who have not passed their courses and are beyond the age permitted for the grade which they need to repeat. It is truly distressing to dismiss these girls. Thanks be to God, this difficulty is now surmounted with the establishment of the different grades of education. With it, we also avoid having in the same class girls of ages or knowledge levels that are very different, with the consequent general lack of progress. Six. And as far as requiring regular attendance, we have no other remedy and to be strict, even though in every case, keeping all the circumstances in mind, we have to see if an absence is justified or not, that is, if sufficient reason exists or not for the girl ought to come to school. However, we should not be content with simply demanding attendance, but rather we have to put the appropriate means into place, even if this requires sacrifice, so that attendance will be good or at least will improve. Among the means, I recommend above all that you strive to have the girls enjoy school and make good use of it, in their religious and moral training as well as in the development of all their good qualities and human abilities. 7. I greatly desire also that the mother's way of dealing with one another and with the girls be a continual manifestation of the love with which the Lord unites us. I heartily encourage the mothers to love this work and to be content to work in it, although it demands sacrifices of them, seeing it as an excellent means of reparation and one especially beloved by our Venerable Mother. The more we know the spirit of the Institute and study its primary documents in depth, the more clearly we see how characteristic of the Institute is the work of our schools and how they must hold pride of place among our apostolates. Plan of Education in the Congregation of the Reparatrices of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, written around the year 1885, during the preparation of the Constitutions, says, Thus, the teachers must procure in carrying out their charge nothing less than the greatest amends and reparation for the offenses which the Sacred Heart of Jesus receives, due mainly to the ignorance about our divine religion which reigns in general, but especially among the simple people. School rules, written during the same time period, have the same focus. As one of the means that the Institute uses to achieve its proposed objective of reparation for the offenses to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the free education of poor girls, promoting in this way the good of souls in the most needy social class, ought to be held in high esteem for everyone who is called to this congregation, so much so that it may never be omitted except for very grave reasons, and that it grow ever more extended, day by day. As far as dealing with the girls is concerned, 
remember that paragraph of the letter of our venerable mother to Mother Felisa de Gessis, in which she says, Don't be upset by these dislikes. As soon as you become joyful again, you will like everything, and you will look at the children specially, not as the inconsequent little beings which they are by nature, but with the interest with which one looks at something very precious, for each soul has cost the blood of God himself. Whatever you do for them, our Lord receives as done to him. Pray much for them to the Sacred Heart, and concern yourself about them as members of his body. May the mothers, then, love the girls with supernatural and intense love, striving, in all that they do, to achieve the greatest good for the girls in the natural and supernatural orders. Only with these dispositions will they be able to avoid petty disagreements between mothers and girls, harsh words directed to our students, and so on. How much I would like for it to be the case that in our schools a raised voice never be heard, that everyone know and practice firmness with great energy and consistency, but at the same time with tenderness and love. Asking the Sacred Heart of Jesus to give you encouragement to carry out this work of improving the level of our primary schools which we have undertaken out of love for him, and anticipating from you a generous cooperation, receive a loving embrace in him from your sister and servant, Christina Estrada To the Superiors of the Academies of Spain Rome, October 12, 1951 In this letter, Mother Christina proposes a reorganization of academies in order to respond to what society and the church are now demanding of education. She also proposes the revision of the norms of discipline and encourages union among all. Through the mother provincials and the prefects of studies of the provinces, you will have learned of the dispositions even dealing with the reorganization of the academies. For some time many of you have felt this need and in various ways have manifested your concerns to me in your letters. Modern society has evolved very rapidly in the last quarter century, and some of the means which were sufficient for the formation of girls and young women 25 years ago are today either insufficient or have lost their usefulness and could even be counterproductive. From this we discover the need to reflect about the means and procedures we use in order to continue the many good things which, thanks to the Lord, we have to rid ourselves of what is useless or harmful and to adopt new practices that are appropriate and conducive to what we want to achieve. The Church, over and over again, and most recently in the recent Congress of Religious Women, which was dedicated to the topic of teaching, has insisted on the need to prepare good educators and teachers in order to form youth in accordance with the demands of modern-day life. The talks of the Congress will be published, and at that point I will send them to you, and will write about some of the points that have been discussed in them. I am going to reflect today with you about aspects of the life of our academies which need improvement or adaptation. In this way, you will be able to understand the reason behind the instructions given and work with the least difficulty possible to fulfill them. First, Religious and moral formation, which was sufficient to keep the youth of 50 years ago on the right path, when the environment in which many of them lived encouraged their piety, is often not sufficient for training our current students in sure and upright criteria and giving them the energetic will needed to resist all the inducements to evil that are found in their social lives and at times even within their families. Our academy students today need us to give them a deeper and more complete religious instruction. This point worries me. I see that not all of ours who give religion classes have the knowledge necessary today. The classes of moral formation which the prefects give can also be very useful in the religious and moral formation of the girls. It is evident that these courses should not be a repetition of religion class, but can and should complement them. For this reason, I desire and have asked that each of the prefects send me the plan that they think best for their courses. I have not yet received these, except from three mothers. I hope that the rest do not delay in arriving. When they have all come in, with this contribution, and the general cooperation of everyone, I hope that a good plan can be created with curriculum and assessments for well-chosen topics in these courses. However, we must never forget that example motivates more than words. 
I urge you to often exhort the mothers and sisters who go to the academy that they regard this work as an apostolate and an act of continued reparation to the heart of Jesus. May they, moved by this spirit, and on fire with zeal for the glory of God, seek in everything they do, say, or undergo in the academy only the good of the girls, setting aside their personal interests and their own tastes and comfort. If they do this, all will work united as one, everyone will help everyone else, each one will be grateful for what she receives from the rest and will be understanding, learning to overlook the deficiencies of others. I am certain that if the personnel of any academy were to make significant progress in this area, the effects on the formation of the girls would be felt right away, as the students will admire the virtues of the mothers and experience gratitude for the interest they show in educating them. Second. When families entrust us with their daughters, they rightly demand that we educate them, that is, that we form them into women who are as they should be and who act as they should act in this earthly life in order to achieve the sublime end for which they were created, this according to the definition of education given by His Holiness Pius VI. The good conduct of a woman includes the fulfillment of her religious duties, her social duties, and the responsibilities she has to herself. Thus we would not fulfill our mission by attending only to their religious and moral formation, we are obligated to educate them for society as well, so that they attain the knowledge appropriate for this end. In this educational area, we have to give thanks to the Lord for the success which all our academies achieved this past year in the students who presented themselves for the state examination and other official tests, however, this must not make us complacent. There are some important deficiencies in the instruction given in our academies. Above all, we have to sincerely recognize that our primary education has not been at the level that it should have been. Even in the great number of classes in which this is better, the girls have learned quite a bit, but little has been done to promote the development of their abilities, to instill the habits of observation, analysis and synthesis, to teach them to reason and expound their ideas with a logical order, etc and some families have expressed dissatisfaction about this. It seems that this is the cause to which we can attribute the difficulties experienced by many youngsters as they make the transition to the first year of secondary education. The human education of the girls, which followed what up to now we called general culture, left much to be desired, and these girls wasted quite a bit of time, perhaps growing accustomed at times to putting forth minimal effort to the detriment of their moral formation. The third thing which concerns me in this list of ideas is the great number of students whom we declare to be unfit for further studies. The fact that the students of an academy obtain good scores in the state examination is not an indicator of the level of the academy, if the only girls who take the test are the particularly gifted students, or the good students who are extraordinarily hard workers. There are well-known cases of intelligent young people who prepared themselves on their own and have gotten brilliant scores. Third, in the matter of raising the level of our teaching, while not in itself sufficient, it is indispensable to have a qualified faculty. As a guarantee of the competence of teachers in the subjects they teach, the following teachers will be asked, beginning with the upcoming school year, to have passed a qualifying examination. Teachers of religion are already certified by the DSEs, teachers who instruct in subjects that do not correspond to their degree, and teachers who do not possess a degree. Those with degrees in classic languages will be exempted, they need not pass an additional examination in order to teach Spanish. Exceptions to mandatory testing will also be extended to teachers who have taught a subject for a certain number of years, this number will be determined and communicated to you soon, if during those years their teaching has been satisfactory. Fourth. One point which I have alluded to repeatedly, and that I want you to be concerned about, is that of discipline. You, who have more occasion than I to observe the students, will doubtless realize that these girls differ greatly from our former students in their ways of responding. Nevertheless, let us not stop there, but rather continue our investigation, and see that today, as never before, young women belong to associations in which at times the discipline is severe and faithfully observed. How can we explain this paradox?
Perhaps the reason can be found in another quality which characterizes today's youth, the critical attitude. This is not bad in itself. It is more difficult, yes, to form the person who has this quality, but once it is achieved, the formation is more solid. The existence of this attitude requires us to understand very well the reason behind everything we demand of students in their studies and in the running of the academy. It is worthwhile to keep in mind that the academy exists for the students and not the students for the academy. Everything in the academy must be directed to the good of the students, and the only good discipline is that which is useful to achieve this good. To mother prefects and all mothers and sisters involved in our primary schools of Spain. Rome, October 12, 1951. Mother Cristina, with exquisite sensitivity, writes to the mothers and sisters who work in schools, helping them to see the care and interest which the Institute from its beginnings has had for this work. She exhorts educators to love their students from the heart. From this love will spring a sincere search for what is best for them. Finally, she asks that they pray often for the girls and that educators maintain unity among themselves. Many of you have in these past few years given up your summer vacations in order to prepare yourselves to receive a teaching degree or certification as kindergarten teachers. In many of our schools, work is being undertaken to improve them. The General Secretariat of Studies has also worked intensively in the preparation of the norms by which our primary schools will be conducted. All of this will have doubtless led you to see the great importance of the work of education of poor girls, a work entrusted to you, and the particular love and interest with which the Institute sees it and should continue to see it. We must always keep in mind that our mother foundresses ought about each of the works to which they would dedicate themselves, and thus we must remember, as the Decretum Laudis proclaims, said sisters are religious especially intend to provide a religious and social education for girls, especially poor girls. I will not spend time elaborating on this point or on the spirit which should move you, because I have written about this to your superiors and they will transmit it to you. I am, instead, going to spend a little time at this point to consider what you must do on your part to ensure that the girl's education be the kind that glorifies and makes reparation to the most sacred heart of Jesus. An indispensable quality of any educator is that of love for her students. If this love truly exists, if you see in the girls the souls which the Lord has entrusted to you, and you love him in them, that love will make you seek at every moment what is best for each girl. He will make you ingenious in finding the methods that will help each and every one of the girls to succeed, thereby preventing and avoiding many mistakes. He will make you understanding, so that in every material failing you will know how to distinguish malice and negligence from the weakness and lack of consistency that characterizes childhood. If to all of this you unite correct judgment, which each of you should strive to instill in yourselves, a judgment which gives to each thing the value it really has, if moreover you act with great self-control, being very firm and constant in requiring what must be demanded, but kind and always gentle in the way you do it, your work of forming the students will be very successful. Give yourselves wholeheartedly to the study of the subjects you teach. Study and read as well good books and journals on the topic of pedagogy and teaching, reading that will expand your horizons, and you will have more resources to deal with the deficiencies in the girls. To the prefects especially at urge study, reading, and reflection. With these means you will become qualified to direct the work of the other teachers and to work more directly and the others in the moral formation of the students. Seek help from the provincial prefect of studies, who can give you very useful and valuable suggestions. I do not want to end this letter without giving all of you, earnestly, a triple recommendation. May you pray very much for your students and teach them to pray, in order to call down upon them heaven's graces. May you work hard to be virtuous in love, everyone being united, not only exteriorly, but rather very much from the heart as you work in a common labor, each one being grateful for the work of the rest and knowing how to accept in one another the deficiencies each one has. Christina Estrada
to several prefects of the academies of Spain. Rome, October 15, 1951. Mother Cristina directs this letter to several prefects of the academies of Spain. In it she gives orientations related to formation and the importance which they should give to studies, discipline, and union among everyone. I have received with interest the information about the academy given me in your letters, and from the heart I commend to the Lord this work which can give him such glory. First, the formation of girls and adolescents has always been extremely important but today this formation must be even more solid so that the students, upon leaving the academy, may be able to maintain themselves on the straight path, in the face of all the attractions which evil will offer them. Formation will be solid if the mind of the young woman who leaves the academy has clear and well-defined criteria, if during the years she has spent in the academy, great and generous ideals corresponding to those criteria have developed in her will and in her heart, and she has become used to overcoming herself in order to live up to them. You must orient the life of the academy in such a way that everything contributes to this formation. A very useful means, among others, can be found in the moral lessons you give to the girls. I have a great interest in seeing that these are developed according to a well-thought-out plan, and I am looking forward to see what each prefect proposes. Second. Although I know that you do it, I still want to encourage you to be interested in the studies of the girls, and that you be creative in ensuring that not only the girls who study officially, but also those who study privately are able to benefit from them. A cultivated mind is better enabled to appreciate things for their true value, and therefore prioritize supernatural interests over the merely earthly. Moreover, the time is past when a person was important in society because of membership in a noble family or even because of wealth. Today, the person with the most influence is the one with personality, and for this reason we want to develop this quality in our students in order to extend the influence of our education. It seems to me that the most important elements that a good personality brings together are an upright, supernatural, and clear set of criteria and a good and energetic will. One sees, indeed, how important it is for all the girls who receive our education to reach a good level of culture, and the prefects must not disregard this important point. Third, another element of formation is discipline. We achieve our goal when discipline comes from an interior motivation. To achieve this end, it is necessary to know perfectly the reason behind every disciplinary practice and its value. It is fitting that you be firm in demanding the best, and that at any moment, you be able to justify that standard to a girl who feels rebellious toward it. External discipline is, as I say, a means of formation, and is always necessary when one lives in community, but it can be presented in various forms. Discipline that was good in one era might end up being harmful in another. One could say that today we have to continue to maintain great discipline, but it makes sense that it be less rigid than in other times, and that the reasoning behind it must be understood by the girls themselves. Sometimes the reason will be evident, but at other times it must be explained to them. It seems also necessary to distinguish between the failure to observe certain disciplinary norms and bad conduct. The former could be the result of a lack of submission or disdain for discipline, and in this case the conduct would cease to be good. But the lack of discipline that comes from the inconstancy that is natural for girls cannot be classified as poor conduct. It could in the same way be harmful for their formation to demand practices that are not justified, whether that be because today they are no longer useful or fitting, or because of the persnickety way in which they are expected to be practiced. The academies are blamed for the fact that for the children educated in them, there are at times two levels of goodness, one for school and one for outside of school. What they learned in the academy does not hold for their behavior outside of it. The truth is that goodness, in its essence, is always the same, and for that reason it is important to emphasize this in the formation the girls receive during their years in the academy. Fourth, so that the girls enjoy school, which will help them in the efforts that study requires and will preserve their good conduct, it would be a good idea to re-establish the former free days that the students so enjoy before. Fifth, 
I wish as well to urge you to strongly encourage union among all the mothers. To that end, it will help to inform them of things beforehand, which will help to prevent much unpleasantness, to communicate to them the successes and difficulties that the academy is enjoying or undergoing, being very simple, patient, and kind with everyone, respecting at all times in front of the girls the authority of the teachers and monitors, being aware of the sacrifice involved in their lives, and showing the mothers appreciation, which the cooperation they offer you merits. If all were united in prayer and action, I am sure that the fruit they would harvest would be abundant. 6. I see that it worries you that the girls, having to dedicate themselves so intensely to study, do not have time for the other activities which make the life of the academy enjoyable. I think that the two things are not incompatible. Before, the girls studied less, but nevertheless, they always had rehearsals during recreation time. They had days off which they enjoyed a great deal, on feast days of obligation almost always, and by choosing the days well, that can happen again now. Christina Estrada